Well, welcome back. I'm glad to see you all here this morning, and uh, hopefully you're enjoying the nice, cool morning that we have had, and just the uh, opportunity that we have to um, praise and worship uh, God, and to remember our dependence on Him. Uh, we're going to continue on in the book of Daniel. Uh, if all goes as planned today, we will finish chapter 1. And so uh, that may be a high bar. So uh, sit down, strap in, hang on, keep your hands and arms inside the bus, and we will move uh, right along smartly through this. You know, as I uh, mentioned last week, I enjoy history. And I like understanding what has transpired in others' lives and to actually be able to see their example. And as I do that, um, it leads me to think about how I might respond in the situations that they find themselves. And um, what, what is it that I need to think about or what is it that I can take away that, uh, that can be applied? Would I do things the same that they did? Would I do them differently? Would I be brave in that situation or cowardly? Would I be the hero or, or the goat, you know, um, the come away from it badly? In regard to spiritual things, would I act faithfully or unfaithfully? Would I fail or would I succeed? And what and, and as I think through those things, I think about what are the things that I can do beforehand that might be able to prepare me for that specific circumstance. Sometimes you hope you never end up there. Um, as you look at what people have had to live through and deal with. But being prepared is an important thing. What things do I need to know? What behaviors might I need to change that would increase the probability of a good or righteous outcome in whatever situation I might find myself? And last week, we spent some time looking at and making the case why we study the Old Testament. What is it about that that is good for us? Well, first off, it's God's Word, and so you can't go wrong there. But um, second off, we saw that He has left us examples, a multitude of examples, things to emulate or imitate, things to avoid, and opportunities to learn from other people being in situations where we might find ourselves. And by doing that and reflecting on those things, it will make us better prepared to do His will as we find ourselves in whatever circumstance God places us. A consistent theme of Daniel is this, and we find it in Daniel chapter 4, verse 25. It says, The Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. As we go through the book of Daniel, we are going to see that God is exercising his sovereignty over the realm of mankind. Every chapter, all from chapter 1 through chapter 12, we are going to be seeing that God is doing this very thing. That he is the ruler over the realm of mankind and he gives it to whomever he wishes. And as he does that, we're going to see that there are going to be significant changes in circumstance that take place in regard to the changing human governments that go on. And those circumstance changes or those government changes affect the people that affect God's people in very, very real ways. But as he does that, as he brings those circumstances along, we also are going to understand that he has a plan. This isn't just willy-nilly, might look that way to us. It's not just God going, ooh, I was surprised by that. No, he's not surprised. He, again, is the ruler over the realm of mankind and just bestows it on whomever he wishes. And so he has a plan. But not only does he have a plan, he provides us the means or the means for his people 
to excel in the middle of the circumstance that they might find themselves. And so today we're going to get to examine a circumstance that the deportees that we saw last week that Nebuchadnezzar took from Jerusalem find themselves in. We're going to look at how they responded to that particular situation and then ponder um, how we might need to prepare to respond in godliness when we find ourselves in similar situations. So with that, let's just jump right in. And uh, I'm going to read the first seven um, verses of Daniel chapter 1. It says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he, that's Nebuchadnezzar, brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youths in whom was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered him to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. The king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank, and appointed that they may, should be educated three years, at the end of which they were entered to enter the king's personal service. Now among them, from the sons of Judah, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them, and to Daniel he assigned the name Belshazzar to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. So we're going to see that Nebuchadnezzar plans, but um, that God provides in the midst of his planning. Nebuchadnezzar, as all good kings should, had a plan for how to manage and to further his kingdom. The Babylonian approach, as we look back through Scripture, is somewhat different than what we see with or have seen with the Assyrians up to this point. The Assyrians moved people around wholesale. When they came into a place, they cleaned it out. They took the majority of the people, the people group there, moved them and resettled them into a different part of the kingdom. And then what they did to backfill was they took people that they had conquered in other places and put them in this new place. And so it's assimilation through mixing up the people. And we see this with the northern kingdom. The, the northern ten tribes of Israel are taken away. They are completely removed from the area, uh, largely deport, deported, and new people brought in. And interestingly enough, we see that in the New Testament because who do we end up with? We end up with the Samaritans who are a mixed race people, some Jews and, and Gentile mixture there. Um, and so they are viewed badly actually by the southern kingdom, by the people of Judah because they had mixed with the nations. So that was the plan of the Assyrians and we see it worked out. The Babylonian approach is a little bit different. What we see here is that Nebuchadnezzar takes some hostages, and if you remember last week, he sets up a king, makes a king a vassal there in Jerusalem. So he takes some of the people and, um, that are valuable to them and move them out. He takes the best and the brightest, as we will see, the influencers of the day that, will, um, that he will take away. And he's gonna show them how to be great ba Babylonians. Right? He's going to in, insert them into the Babylonian culture. And one way he's going to do that is by education. He's going to educate them. He's going to give them a PhD in Babylonian. He's going to flatter them with food. We'll see that he gives them his choice food. 
He's going to change their names. He's going to give them Babylonian names so that they fit right in. And then he's going to employ them, after all of this is done, he's going to employ them in his government, in his administration, to accomplish his purposes. And there's some wisdom in this, right? I mean, first off, we see that, the, that in Proverbs that there is, a, there is wisdom in a multitude of counselors. A diverse set of counselors can give you a great ability to see and understand situations. But he also needs people who understand the culture of the people that are being managed. Because he has not removed them wholesale. So he needs somebody there to help keep tabs on things, to keep them moving in the right direction, to keep them calm and under control. And then he needs people who understand and own this new system that they are now living under as they manage that people group. So to carry out his will with the people that he has conquered. And ultimately, what he's trying to do is assimilate people into Babylonian culture. We see in 2 Kings the fact that he actually leaves people behind in the area of Jerusalem and Judah. And the people that he leaves behind are those that are very, very poor and very, very dependent. And so, and then he places a man, a, a Jewish man, over them to manage them as the governor. And so he leaves the people group intact, but he leaves them dependent on his regime as he goes along. And he leaves them as a resource. He has slaves there that he can pull from, as, as we see in the future. And he also is going to receive tribute from them as they continue to maintain the land. So Nebuchadnezzar commands a fellow named Ashpenaz that we see here to carry out this plan for assimilation with, uh, with these people that he has deported. We're going to see that Ashpenaz is, is an important man in the administration. We are going to run across him not only later in this chapter, but in chapter 2 we will see him. He is the chief of Nebuchadnezzar's officials. Now some of your uh, translations, and I think the ESV says that, that he is the chief eunuch. Okay? And you think, oh, okay, that's interesting. Well, that word can mean a castrated man. Okay, And that was done for uh, two men that were put in charge of harems. But in a broader sense, we see it more generally used as a high official. Not necessarily that he went through that procedure, but that he is a high official. This same, this same term is actually used for Potiphar in uh, Genesis when we run across him with Joseph. And uh, we know that he was married. And so we assume that he had a family and such. So, um, so anyway, Ashpenaz is a high official. He is chief of Nebuchadnezzar's officials. And Nebuchadnezzar gives him a command and gives him a set of criteria for the type of folks that he's looking for to assimilate into his service. We see that he is to choose and bring to Babylon people of royal seed and noble birth in, in verse 3. Now, obviously this is to be done to establish and show Nebuchadnezzar dominance over them because when you bring people into your court to serve you, that shows that you are in charge. And so that's part of what's going on here. We see, too, that because he's left people behind and a king behind, that these people probably serve as leverage and as hostages to help maintain control of the area of Jerusalem and Judah. But also, if you think about it, he's bringing in royal seed and nobles, and so they are probably already prepared to accomplish some of the types of work that he is going to ask them to do in his administration. So it's like, hey... If I don't have to build this from the ground up, I can use what somebody else has done, and that's good for me. We see in verse 4 that um, he is told to get youths. This word usually indicates somebody between the ages of 13 and 17 in, uh, in historical documents. And most likely, they are on the younger end here, probably in the realm of 13 to 15. Because as we looked at some Persian documentation, 
they started their training programs in the ages of 13 to 15 and did what we see here, that they're going to train them for three years. So um, here are youths. Daniel and his friends are probably 13 to 15 years old. He's looking for guys with no defects. They've got all their arms and legs, fingers and toes, and all of the parts work. Okay? So physically perfect, if you will. They're good looking too. Uh, handsome, it says here, of good appearance. And then showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge. So he's looking for intelligent people, people that are trainable, endowed with understanding as literally knowers of knowledge. So the assumption here is that they already have a good education. And then discerning knowledge is actually understanders of knowledge. So they are able to learn. So it's looking for people who are intelligent and who are educated and have a knack for learning. It's looking for people that have the ability to serve in the king's court. So they need poise and presence. They need to be able to give wise counsel and able to administer or manage things that the king puts their hands to. They need to look good. And also, they are all about making the king look good. Right? So your court, my court, is going to be the perfect people, the influencers, the wise people, the educated people, and the good-looking people are all going to be there to serve Nebuchadnezzar. And then as I mentioned, he's going to send them to Babylon University, where they are going to get a PhD in Babylonian. It says to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans in verse 4. This is a three-year program, so it's not, uh, not to be taken lightly. And they are to learn the language, so speaking, reading, and writing. The language of the time is uh, Aramaic. That was uh, what the official language of the Chaldeans was. Interestingly enough, you see Aramaic in the New Testament, right? So this has long... God is doing things here that are bringing people along into the future. Uh, the other thing they would learn is Akkadian, which also, you know, the, you've seen the cuneiform tablets, the little clay tablets with the triangle marks all, all punched out. Well, that's Akkadian. So they would have been learning how to write and record things for the king. They are also to learn the literature. Now, this most likely runs the full range of what we might think of as education. So it can include law, can include science, could include just literature, the arts, as well as religion. And so they are going to get the full range of Babylonian knowledge because again, what are they trying to do here? He's trying to prepare people to serve in his court. So he wants people that know a lot and are able to speak and are able to record for him. He's gonna privilege them with the best food and drink. He, it says he assigned them a daily allotment from the king's food and wine. First off, he wants to make sure they're getting enough. Again, remember this good-looking thing? He wants them to look well. And we're going to see that that's important in the way that Ashpenaz responds here in just a couple of verses. Another thing, this might be a perk. Okay, So this is a privileged thing. People that the king favored, he would provide food for and drink for. And so this is a perk to them, um, maybe to distract them from the fact that they are um, captive and, uh, and placed here. So uh, try to keep the rebellion at a minimum by giving them some good stuff. Um, so he privileges them with the best food and drink. And then lastly, we see that Ashkenaz assigns them new Babylonian names. They are no longer Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They now become Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But in the midst of this plan, so we see Nebuchadnezzar has a plan of how he is going to assimilate this people for his purpose. But we see that God provides. Not only does he provide people that can meet Nebuchadnezzar's plan, he provides above and beyond so that they are people that can meet his plan as well. 
Remember in uh, verse 2 it says, The Lord gave Jehoiakim king of Judah into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God. Well, because Nebuchadnezzar, uh, God gave Nebuchadnezzar Jehoiakim and the vessels and Jerusalem, then we can expand to that to assume that God has provided the people that he has deported as well that meet, that meet Nebuchadnezzar's requirements. God has sent people along that would fulfill his own plans and his own purposes for his own people. And in verse 6, we see that Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are among these. God has sent them as a part of a group of people that come along that Ashpenaz selects. Some of the reading I did said there's probably a group of 50 to 75 people. So not a huge group, but a smaller crowd that they are bringing along to educate. And so what do we know about these four men that uh, are called out specifically? First off, we know they meet the requirements. They're young, they're of the nobility or royal family. Josephus said that they may have come from Zedekiah's family, and we see Zedekiah established later. Um, they are without defect, they're good looking, so prime specimens of manhood. They're intelligent, knowledgeable, have an aptitude from learning, but also we can gather some other information about them as we look through the book. Maybe they had godly parents. So why would we say that? Well, because of their names. Daniel's name means God is my judge. Hananiah's name means Yahweh is gracious. Mishael is who is what God is. And Azariah is Yahweh has helped me. And also we'll see that they seem to have a pretty good knowledge of Scripture. So there is the possibility that these four men had godly parents, were part of the remnant of godly people there in Jerusalem. We'll see in verse 8 that they were men of conviction. We see further on that they are men of prayer. And then... Additionally, in regard to Daniel specifically, we come to understand that he is specially gifted with the ability to interpret dreams and visions, that he is a righteous man. Ezekiel, his contemporary, calls him out on the same plane as Job and Noah in the book of Ezekiel, so a righteous man. He is wise, Ezekiel uh, says uh, as well. He's of exceptional quality, we'll see in chapter 6. We, uh, he is a student of Scripture, we'll see in chapter 9 and chapter 10. He's humble, we'll see in chapter 2 and chapter 10. He's bold with the gospel, we talked about that last week. And he is esteemed by God. He's one who, pray, when he prays, God moves. And we'll see in chapter 9, when Daniel's praying, God sends angels to answer his prayer. It's not just, oh, just wait, it'll happen. I, sent, I deployed somebody now. To answer your prayer. So he is one who is esteemed by God. And we'll see that these are men who persevere to the end. It's not just for the short haul. They're going to do this for a lifetime. Um, Daniel is most likely in his mid-80s when we run across him in verse 21. So um, here he is from 13 to 80. We're going to see that he actually remains faithful and continues to do what God does. Think about in chapter 6 where he's facing the lions. He's probably 85. And then receiving his final vision even later. So God provides Nebuchadnezzar with his own best of the best to carry out his plans. So Nebuchadnezzar thinks he has accomplished his plans, but it's really God, God that is providing him with people to accomplish his plans and to fulfill his plan for his own people. So let's see how they handle themselves. So we're going to look at verses 8 through, 8 through 17 now. It says, But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. And the commander of the officials said to Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king, who has appointed your food and drink. 
For why should he see your faces looking more haggard than the youths who are your own age? Then you would make me forfeit my head to the king. But Daniel said to the overseer, whom the commander of the officials had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days and let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be observed in your presence and the appearance of the youths who are eating the king's choice food and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and he tested them for ten days. At the end of ten days their appearance seemed better and they were fatter than all the youths who had been eating the king's choice food. So the overseer continued to withhold their choice food and the wine they were to drink and kept giving them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. So in this section here, we see that the men purpose and then God provides. Imagine what kind of pressure Daniel and his friends are under to comply with this Babylonian or worldly system. They're young. They've been taken out of their home. Their parents aren't there to keep them in line. And probably temptations galore in that environment. They're expected to learn the language, the literature, the science. They're assigned new names. And, and so Daniel, we see, becomes Belshazzar, which means Bel protect the king. Shadrach is, I am very fearful of Aku, is who is one of the local gods. Meshach becomes who is Aku is, or who is what Aku is. And Abednego becomes a servant of Nebo. So they receive heathen names, and they're expected to eat the king's food. And so, you know, as I think about situations where I might find myself like that, peer pressure's high. And the uh, easy thing to do is just roll over and comply. But, in the face of all of this, Daniel made up his mind, and apparently his three friends here join in, not to defile themselves. So they purposed, New King James said that they purposed, um, not to defile themselves, that they set in his heart, or that they resolve. This is not a lightly made decision. It is something that is considered, that is done with full knowledge. And so he ends up taking a stand, in this case, with food and wine, as we see. Now, why would he choose food and wine? Why would food maybe cause him to defile himself? Well, first off, they've got the Levitical law, right? So there's clean and unclean. They give strict guidelines for what you can eat, what you can't eat, and how it should be prepared. And so the, apparently the Babylonians were big on pork and horse flesh. And so both of those are unclean animals. They probably wouldn't have prepared it according to the law. It might have been prepared with the blood still in it, we see. And... Um, the practice also was that the king's food would have been consecrated to the Babylonian idol or the Babylonian god. And so by eating this, you are acknowledging the god of the Babylonians. So why would wine have caused them to defile themselves? There's not any kind of scriptural um, um, command that you abstain from wine, except in the case of being a Nazarite or taking a Nazarite vow. And apparently these guys were not that. So this is an area of conviction for Daniel. And again, it's most likely based on the wine being consecrated also to the local God. Now, you think about that. Okay, food and wine. There's other things going on here. Why didn't they object to the required learning? Why didn't they object to a name change? Well, if we think about it, and again, as we use Scripture as our guide, there is no scriptural mandate forbidding these things. They, they can weigh what they know against Scripture about what it is that they are learning. They can make assessments of whether this is truth or falsehood based on what God has revealed in His Word. So they can do this with no issue regarding conscience or conviction. 
And so they apply themselves to their studies. They apparently don't grumble at being called by their Babylonian names either. So in that, let's think of two, two and notice how they behave as they purpose not to defile themselves. We're going to see that they act with godliness, that they act with courage, and that they act with courtesy. They are respectful and humble. I mean, they work within the authority structure that they have been placed under. They didn't complain, they didn't rebel, they didn't pout, they didn't shout, or go on a hunger strike. You know, all of those things were options for them. What did they do instead? They request permission of the guy in charge not to eat the choice food. Now, they get a negative answer from him for an interesting reason. Because he has been given a charge and he is worried about his performance in regard to the things that the king has charged him with. He's afraid of the king. He's afraid that the king is going to take his head if these guys aren't good looking, are not well fed, are not cared for, and ready to serve in my court. And we'll learn later that fear of Nebuchadnezzar is no idle fear. He is a man to be feared. Um, certainly with some of his character traits, as we will learn. But Daniel and his friends persist. They go, okay, well, we got a negative answer there, so, so let's request of somebody else. So they request of the overseer that is directly over them and proposed this solution of vegetables. Now, vegetables here is, is sown food, so it probably includes grains and nuts and fruits, etc. And then water, and asks, says, hey, uh, let's do this for 10 days, see how this goes. Now, Ashpenaz is one step removed, okay? He could go, okay, that's not my problem. That, that guy did that, so I'm safe. Um, has plausible deniability. He has enough time to judge. He gives enough time to judge a difference, but not so that they'll look so bad that maybe this other guy will be um, exposed to Nebuchadnezzar's wrath. And um, so this time they get a positive result. And they get a positive result from their test as well. And so are allowed to continue. But remember, as they are purposing to do this in their own lives, God is also working to bolster their efforts. Through their godly interaction, I imagine they were a pleasure to be around. They, they aren't the guys that i got to worry about. They aren't the ones who are complaining or sloughing off in the back when I'm not looking. That... They are just a, a joy to be around. And so God inclines Ashpenaz to favor toward them and toward their request. And I believe that in their obedience, God works in their physical health to make them look better than the others in just this period of 10 days. I, I kind of believe that there may be some supernatural work going on here as well, that God is preparing them in ways that that promote them and, and position them for what he wants of them later. Remember, these are youngsters. I don't know, think about your 13 to 15 year olds and where they are. Um, this good biblical foundation that they have prepares them to work in godliness and, and uh, in a completely worldly and godly system. And so God is faithful to support their godly actions for his own plan and glory. Now, he doesn't, he doesn't guarantee an easy set of circumstances, but he does work. Which leads us to the final outcome here. Daniel 1, 18-21. Then at the end of the days, which the king had specified for presenting them, the commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and out of them all, not one was found like Daniel, Ananias, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's personal service. As for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and conjurers who were in his realm. And Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus the king. 
So the presentation. At the end of their training, Ashpenaz brings them before the king for their final exam. And interestingly, this is oral exam by Nebuchadnezzar himself, apparently, which gives us more insight into Nebuchadnezzar. He apparently is no academic slouch. Okay? This is a guy who knows his stuff. We know from history, too, that he is a great strategist and tactician, which allows him to conquer as much as he did. But he is also somebody to be feared. And so in the midst of this, we have fear and admiration, right? We see the same characteristics that can be worked out here that we should be working out for God. He finds them ten times better than, their, than his standing advisors. You know, they look better than the rest, they are gifted, and they graduate at the top of their class. So, this should be no surprise for us, because God has been provided. God gave these men, God granted favor for these men, God caused them to look better than the rest, He gifts them with the ability to learn, and He allows them to graduate at the top of their class. These are men who have true wisdom and true understanding. Now, 1 Corinthians 3, 19-20 says, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God, for it is written, He is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise, that they are useless. And we know and uh, assume that Daniel had uh, this insight as well, that Proverbs 9.10 tells us, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So God has prepared them for His service, for God's service, as they are serving in Nebuchadnezzar's court, bringing knowledge of Himself to the Babylonians and caring for His deported people. So in the face of this, okay, we have an example. What, what, should we, what should our practice be in light of this? So the next time that you're confronted with having to take a stand against the world, how are you going to purpose to do that? Well, first off, we need to know our scripture. We need to know what God expects of us. And this goes for the do's and the don'ts. James tells us in James 1.22, but prove yourselves to be doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. And Paul says in Romans 12, 2, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. We need to work to study and understand and be firmly convinced of our convictions. Romans 14, 5 and 6 says, One person regards one day above another. Another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. Because he who observes the day observes it for the Lord, and he who eats does so for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. So hopefully, you won't just roll over, show your soft underbelly and comply. And hopefully, you won't... Um, turn to your non-Christian friends for advice in how to deal with the world, but you will turn to God's Word. And then we should uh, purpose when we take a stand like this to do it in a godly manner. Don't complain and grumble. Don't be passive-aggressive. Just be quiet and disobey. Don't assault the character or the uh, intelligence of the person with whom you have the disagreement. But let's use Daniel's example and offer the honor and respect that, are, that we are commanded to give to them. First Peter says, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. Paul says, render to all what is due them. Tax to whom tax, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. We need to have our fear placed appropriately and remember what Jesus told His disciples. Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear Him 
who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Will our purpose to obedience always turn out well circumstantially? Well, not necessarily. You know, think of I think about Daniel and uh, I've been reading through Jeremiah. Jeremiah had a rough life. You know, he was doing God's will. He was obedient in the extreme. And, and he didn't get the best food. He didn't get the comfy bed to sleep in and people to care for him. He was not in a great place circumstantially. But hopefully, in that, we will respond as those men did and um, respond like... Uh, Dan, or the Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and I love this verse. This is one of my favorite passages in Scripture. Daniel 3, 16 through 18. He says, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. For if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. He will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. That's a stand. That's a stand that's a stand with words and actions. And so as we deal with the pressures of the world and work on determining where and when we should comply or not, my prayer is that we will turn to Scripture and that we will have well-formed convictions and that we'll be respectful in our interactions with those over us. And that we'll be able to relax in God's sovereignty in the face of that. And as He is sovereign over our situation. And that we would be people of character, encouraged by the examples that we see of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for that you are sovereign, that you are working out your plan, even though it may not seem like it to us. Help us to relax in the fact that we know you are a sovereign God, that you are in control of all things. And in that, Father, we ask that we would be people that are submitted to you, that we are able to be people of character, that we would carry your words and the actions that you call us to into the world so that we can be a light for you in whatever circumstances we might find ourselves. So we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.